As many of you know, I basically made my foray into online media by basically being something of an armchair historian. As Malcolm X beautifully put it, of all fields of study, history is best suited to reward our research. And he was absolutely right. When you put things in a chronological order, you gain context, you gain insight, you gain understanding. That's why history has always been so important to me. And why whenever I do a video essay, you'll notice that I put things into context by putting everything into chronological order. Now you can see how events play out. You can understand that 99% of the stuff that's been happening has not been chance. It's been planned out. But that only becomes clear to you once you put things in their proper chronological order. Kamala Harris's presidential campaign is DOA. In fact, it was DOA before she even announced her candidacy. She was the desperate attempt by white supremacy to try to get black folks to get off this black empowerment stuff. But first, you got to fracture black unity, black political coherence. You got to fracture it. They've been seeing that black people were gravitating toward the message of the black media. And the goal was get these Negroes off of that. Get them off of it now. Well, what were we going to do? Well, we got to do something big and flashy and something that's going to be a huge distraction. Oh, Obama 2.0. Yeah, Obama fooled them. Well, it looked look, look like they did, but okay, they're mad. Well, the Negroes were mad with Obama. They were mad that Obama didn't do anything for them. So uh, uh, we're going to get somebody else out there. And it's going to be a it's going to be a biracial woman this time. Instead of it being someone who's half Kenyan, it'll be someone who's half Jamaican, sorta. And she's going to get out there, and she'll be saying "you go, girl," and she's going to be saying that uh, she's so sympathetic with black people, and that's just going to fool them. Because black people had fallen for the okie doke so many times before. White supremacy has been having a heyday for the last hundred and fifty years, arbitrarily choosing some tool who the white media will then give some publicity to, give some headlines to, they'll give laudatory praise to them, or if they're really slick, what they'll say is, here's this black firebrand, and oh, he's shaking things up, and oh, you know, we kind of wag our finger at this guy. And black people will be, oh, well, if the white powers that be are wagging their finger at him and criticizing this guy, granted, they're giving him tons of publicity and coverage, but there must be something basically legit about him, right? See, white supremacy understands how to be sophisticated. And it's the most sophisticated form of propaganda when something presents itself as opposition, when in reality it's actually support. White supremacy excels at that. But before we can look at where we're going, we gotta look at where we've been. And when you look at the curious case of Kamala Harris, when you look at the thought who would be president, you see a typical case study in how white supremacy operates by choosing some tool from obscurity, elevating them through the white media that they control, and then trying to present them to black people and use us as their base, their grassroots support, so that they have a built-in foundation supposed to be the former slaves. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at Kamala Harris's rise and fall at our hands so that we can understand how white supremacy keeps running this game on us. And we can also go ahead and take a moment to understand how we stopped it, because this is going to be M.O. going forward. And by the way, when you see these people who are pretending as if they're so indignant about Kamala Harris being knocked out of the box, keep in mind, these are the fools who thought they were going to get something out of a Kamala Harris presidency. Oh, poor Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. Poor April Ryan. Poor Roly Poly Martin. All these boule bootlicks, most of them immigrants. All these undercover migrants who were just so sure that they were going to be getting a job in the future Kamala Harris administration. You had all these dumb Negroes auditioning for a job by kissing her behind and bigging her up. All these talentless clowns whose only skill is trashing the former slaves and ignoring white supremacy. I've always taught you that whenever somebody is getting angry about something, 90% of the time that anger is rooted in fear. So when you see the Angela Rise with lettuce and tomatoes on the side and the Roly Poly Martins and the Joy Reeds angry about Kamala Harris getting crushed by the descendants of American slaves, 
by the foundational black Americans who got out there and threw our weight around and showed that we could crush a presidential candidate like that. When you see them getting all scared about it, when you see them getting all angry, you need to be asking, what is it that they're afraid of? Because that's what their ang this false anger is a front for. It's a front for their fear. And when you look at Joy Reid, who happens to be an immigrant, you look at Roly Poly Martin, another immigrant. You look at Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side, another immigrant. You start realizing these are the people who white supremacy imported into the country so that they could have themselves a buffer class in the black community. These were going to be the tools who white supremacy would send among us and say, see, they're one of you. They're just like you. They're no they have the exact same experience as you. And you need to listen to these guys. And what they see is we are cutting the puppet strings. We are not listening to any white supremacist puppets. We're listening to our own power because that never steers us wrong. The black misleadership class and these black boule and immigrants, they understand exactly the purpose that they serve under white supremacy. They understand why white supremacy brought them here. And they also understand completely what it is that white supremacy expects them to do. They are here to derange our internal politics. They are here to sow the seeds of dysfunction within the ranks of the former American slaves. That's what they're here to do. And what's happening is we are casting them out. We are isolating them. We are making them anathema to the body politic of black society. And they know that once we have done that to them, white supremacy has no need for them and no use for them. They're in a fight for their lives. They're, that's why they're so angry right now, because they know that their white paymasters are looking at this and going, well, hell, what do we need you immigrant scumbags for anyway? We don't need you guys anymore. That's what white supremacy is saying. You guys are useless to us. And when white supremacy is through with its tools, it always breaks its tools. That's the threat that we have now faced them with. Now, let's go ahead and examine the sordid past of Kamala Harris and see how this trash bag rose to prominence. Kamala Harris began her career as a white supremacist tool in 1990 when she was hired by the Alameda County DA's office. But she was a parasite on the make and desperately looking for someone who would help her graduate from being a career bureaucrat to being a player in the political sphere. So Kamala Harris started doing the cheese and croissant party circuit. And being a young woman with light skin, well, she knew that she would be the belle of the ball for certain politicians, especially a number of the black males with no better sense. And she would come to the attention of then California Speaker of the Assembly, Low Down Willie Brown. Being one of the black baby boomers, Low Down Willie Brown would do like Andrew Young and John Lewis and Elijah Cummings and John Conyers and all the other fakers, frauds, and phonies. He would use the civil rights movement as a springboard to a life of comfort and wealth for himself. He would try to be the head Negro in charge. He's going to speak for all the little field Negroes while Massa cakes him off something sweet. That's what Low Down Willie Brown was all about. So what happened was white supremacy gave him a, a token position as Speaker of the Assembly. And as a result, Kamala Harris decided to start snuggling up with old Low Down Willie Brown. She had finally found her patron. And so, having gotten herself a sugar daddy, it was time to sit back and let the administrative arm of white supremacy in the form of the California political machine give her a nice elevator ride to the top. 1994. Why is government so bloated? Why are there so many useless and redundant offices, organizations, and departments? Because politicians have to pay back donations through policy, and one of them is jobs for the contributors and their family and friends. They use the government as their own personal piggy bank. But also it's a way to reward allies and concubines, which brings us to Kamala Harris. Willie Brown would make sure that his pet thought would be taken care of nicely. He, or rather the California taxpayers, footed the bill to give Kamala a 1994 BMW, which she traded in for another car. So not only did she get to drive one nice car, she just went ahead and traded it in as if it was hers while the taxpayers were being made to pay for this political prostitute. 
It was no secret to the media at all. They reported on it frequently, but unfortunately, as we would see with Kamala Harris as her career ascended, if the DA or the attorney general decides that they're not going to prosecute, then it doesn't matter what the law says. Now, Kamala's pimp, I mean um, patron, low-down Willie Brown, was Speaker of the California Assembly in 94, and he used his position to just put her on the State Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board. No experience required. Because she gave excellent dictation. This patronage job paid so well and required so little attendance that Kamala Harris took a six-month leave of absence from the Alameda DA's office just so she could enjoy what amounted to basically free money. She stayed there for about six months, which means she got paid about $50,000 or so for doing what amounts to a part-time job. But Kamala didn't like having to take some time away from persecuting black people, so she wanted a job that required her to show up for work a lot less. 1995, Willie Brown gives Kamala another patronage job immediately afterwards, this time on the California Medical Assistance Commission. Now, the very first thing we need to establish is that Kamala Harris's very presence on that commission was patently illegal. I'm not talking about it was illegal on some sort of technicality. It was against the law. California state law requires that in order to be on the Medical Assistance Commission, you must have experience in hospital management, health delivery systems, and health care insurance. At that point, Kamala Harris's only qualification to do anything was that she had a law degree. She had not worked in the medical field or done anything else outside of law, so putting her on that commission was illegal. But Willie Brown has been California's foremost bootlick to white supremacy, so they'd allow him to give his pet thought a patronage job because that's what a lot of these commissions and such are. They're patronage jobs. This is a way that you can reward your allies and your mistresses in a million other ways, and you can make the taxpayer foot the bill for it. Now, reports on how much commissioners on the California Medical Assistance Commission get paid annually varies, but in 1994, the Los Angeles Times said that a commissioner got paid $72,000 a year. Other publications like SanFranciscoGate.com said it was as much as almost $100,000 a year. But for the sake of argument, we'll go ahead and go with the estimate from California's paper of record. And it only requires the commission members to meet twice per month. That's one day every other week. Even so, even though the job only required a laughable two days a month, Harris managed to miss nearly 20% of commission meetings for the last two years that she was on the commission. The medical commission required so little attendance that Harris was easily able to maintain her day job as a prosecutor with both the Alameda County and later San Francisco DA's offices, which she was made an assistant DA at in 1998. Fast forward to 2000. Like her hero, Barack Obama, Kamala Harris would fail the first time that she tried to unseat a political rival. Kamala Harris was angry at her new boss, San Francisco DA Terrence Hallinan, for appointing a non-career prosecutor to be his chief assistant DA instead of choosing her. I guess she figured she was entitled to it, as she was entitled to so much else. She got some of her office cronies together, and they spent several months trying to badmouth and to whisper campaign against chief assistant DA Salomon, but Hallinan refused to fire him. Rather than stay on and make sure that dangerous criminals were being prosecuted and letting bereaved black mothers cry on her shoulder, Kamala Harris instead decided to resign from the San Francisco DA's office in a huff, and she went to go work for the city attorney's office instead. So much for being dedicated to public safety and law enforcement. So much for being eager to see dangerous criminals off the streets. The only thing Kamala Harris has ever cared about are her own personal fortunes, and if she doesn't get her way, well, she'll just take her ball and go home, don't you know? Kamala would stay in the city attorney's office for three years. Basically, it was another patronage job. She was just biding her time until the next election for San Francisco DA came around. 2003. Kamala Harris announced her candidacy for San Francisco DA, and what was her very 
first move? It was to secure the endorsement of the San Francisco Police Union. And she was proud of that, as was the San Francisco Police Department. In fact, the head of the local death squad said, quote, When the district attorney indicts 10 officers in one year, that's a problem. See, the San Francisco police was mad with D.A. Hallinan because D.A. Hallinan had long been critical of and challenging and confronting the police. And what he had done was he indicted 10 police officers for a brawl they got involved in with citizens regarding, believe it or not, fajitas. So what happened was the DA decided that he was going to go after the cops and he would have to actually go after some of the San Francisco police higher ups. And the police union says when the DA indicts 10 police officers in a year, that's a problem. No, when the DA indicts 10 police officers, that's not a problem. That is the solution. Practically any office of law enforcement in this country you can name is a nest of vipers, and most of them are open toilets of white supremacy. So the police make it clear why they backed Kamala Harris, because DA Hallinan was doing his job, putting cases on the cops, and the police had been given assurances by Kamala Harris that she wouldn't do that. And when you look at what happened after she became DA and later California Attorney General, you see that there was a blatant hands-off policy where police corruption and brutality was concerned. If the police gave Kamala their vote, she would turn a blind eye to whatever acts of criminality or racism they committed, including murder. Kamala Harris was only too eager to prove that her working campaign slogan was going to be soft on police brutality and hard on black people. 2004, Kamala Harris, after getting the police union's endorsement, decided she had the right kind of support to take on and unseat her boss, D.A. Hallinan. She won. D.A. Hallinan was hardly a friend of the black community, by the way, but the local pig patrol didn't like him, and that had to stand for something. They preferred Kamala Harris, and it quickly became obvious why. Kamala Harris would make her career in California politics by giving black people nice-sounding words about how laws are too tough. But when around police and other usually white law enforcement types, she would deliver exactly the opposite message, sounding no different than any other anti-black racist. And I believe a child going without an education is tantamount to a crime. So I decided I was going to start prosecuting parents for truancy. Well, this was a little controversial in San Francisco. <laughs> Can you believe this grinning ghoul? Every time she talks about locking people up, she breaks out into uncontrollable laughter. And she's talking about locking up kids' parents. She's talking about separating children from their parents. She's talking about breaking up families. And this is going to be disproportionately black families. And she's laughing like it's the funniest thing she ever heard. She just can't contain herself. To her, this is high comedy. This is the level of the sick mentality of Kamala Harris. And this is before she even became attorney general. This is back when she was still D.A. <laughs> And frankly, my staff went bananas. They were very concerned because we didn't know at the time whether I was going to have an opponent in my re-election race. But I said, look, I'm done. This is a serious issue, and I've got a little political capital, and I'm going to spend some of it. Now, two things there. First of all, notice how she said that her staff's big concern was whether or not she was going to have a political opponent in the next election. Not the damage it was going to do to these children, black children, to be torn away from their parents, not the damage it would be doing to these black families, but whether or not it was going to negatively impact Kamala Harris and her own political fortunes. I suppose she's putting first things first, namely herself. But the second thing is, notice the wording that she used. I've got some political capital and now I'm going to spend some of it. You know who she got that from? She got that word for word from George W. Bush. When he was sitting there talking about his re-election, I got me some capital, I got political capital, I'm going to spend some of it. So here you have an alleged liberal Democrat using the exact same words as a white right-wing Republican. And this is what we did. 
we recognized that in that initiative, as a prosecutor and law enforcement, I have a huge stick. The school district has got a carrot. Let's work in tandem around our collective objective and goal, which is to get those kids in school. Oh, how very interesting. The DA's office has got a big stick. Full of herself, ain't she? And the schools have got a carrot. And uh, let's work in tandem to uh, uh, get these kids in school. Yeah, that's the ticket. You notice who's missing from her little equation as far as getting the kids in school? You notice who she doesn't mention as being part of her team? She doesn't mention the parents. She doesn't speak in terms of, let's bring the parents into this process so we can all work together. Instead, it's, it's going to be the DAs and it's going to be the schools against these parents. Which she knows to be black parents. That lets you know this heifer has a bunker mentality and it's going to be her and the white supremacist against the black community because that's the subtext of what she's saying. So I sent a letter out on my letterhead to every parent in the school district outlining the connection that was statistically proven between elementary school truancy, high school dropouts, who will become a victim of crime, and who will become a perpetrator of crime. We sent it out to everyone. A friend of mine actually called me and he said, Kamala, my wife got the letter. She freaked out. She brought all the kids into the living room, held up the letter, said, if you don't go to school, Kamala's gonna put you and me in jail. Yes, we achieved intended effect. There she goes laughing again. The prospect of putting people in jail just makes her the happiest person on earth. They should stop calling her Kamala and start calling her the Joker. And through that initiative, we found cases like the case of the woman who was by herself raising her three children, holding down two jobs, and homeless. She just needed some help. But by shining this infrared spotlight of public safety on the fact that her children aren't in school, we were able to figure that out, get her access to services that exist. And through that process, the attendance of her children improved. We dismissed the charges against her. And overall, we've improved attendance for this population in San Francisco by 20% over the last two years. The family noticed the wording that Kamala Harris used here. This is some more of her weasel words. She's trying to make it sound like, oh, there was this homeless woman who came to our attention. No, it came to the media's attention. Kamala Harris had been doing this whole approach of she was going to be rounding up as many black parents as possible and trying to put cases on them en masse. And this is part of a social terrorism tactic. This is a means of gentrification, a means of ethnic cleansing. You make it where you use the power of the state to harass and to persecute targeted populations as a means of driving them out. And that's what she was doing. So she's trying to whitewash it and make it sound like, oh, this woman came to our attention. And because of that, we gave her the help that she needed and we uh, dismissed the charges. Whoa, there should never have been charges put on her in the first place. Well, what happened was this woman came to the media's attention first to the public's attention first and Kamala Harris as usual she only did what was right after she failed to be able to prosecute someone then she decided well try to get myself some PR points to make it seem like I was on the side of the angels but that's what she just got through saying she's sitting here telling the story out of order so that she can leave the part about charges toward the very end well you know we, we dropped the charges those charges never should have been brought in the first place. This is not a woman who cares about people. As you see, every time she laughs her butt off, the only thing she cares about is how many black people she can put in prison. And family, I find it particularly galling, particularly disgusting that this degenerate pustule decided that she was going to put charges on a woman who she knew to be homeless. You got a woman who's living in the streets, working two jobs. This is one of the people who America has failed. This woman didn't fail. America failed her. And because of that, Kamala Harris decides, well, she's not under enough pressure. Yeah, she's homeless. Yeah, she's on the street with her children. Yeah, because of the fact that she's working two jobs and still can't even get a roof over her head. Let's go ahead and intensify the pressure on her. Let's go ahead and make it even worse. 
It never occurred to Kamala Harris that perhaps the reason that these kids were truant from school is because of the fact that they didn't know where the hell they were going to be staying that night. It's kind of hard to concentrate on your studies or to get too enthused about going to school when you don't know where the hell you're going to be sleeping tonight. That didn't occur to Kamala Harris, but what did occur to her was, first impulse, let's put some charges on some people. How about helping them out? Nah, helping people out is not our job. Our job is locking these niggers up. That's what Kamala Harris is about. That disgusts me. You got this woman who's at the end of her rope. Society has completely and thoroughly failed her. The white supremacist project of America that was never set up to help her has completely and thoroughly run her into the ground. The only thing that should be on anyone's mind is how do we help this woman? Full stop. Not Kamala Harris. Only thing on her mind was, do you think we can put a case on her? You think we can make a case? Oh, she's too sympathetic a defendant, huh? Hmm. Well, okay, I guess that'd probably be a bad prosecution then. She's too sympathetic to a jury. Yeah, but if she had a roof over her head, we'll get her. Yeah, we'll go ahead and get her into a, into a house, try to get her into an apartment or something. Then we'll put some charges on her. That's what Kamala Harris's degenerate mentality goes to. The fact that she would do that to a homeless person, to a homeless mother with her children on the streets, this woman, this individual, this piece of dirt who is not worthy to breathe the same air as decent people, this piece of trash just disgusts me no end. And you wonder where my bottomless pit of revulsion for her comes from. You wonder why it was that I couldn't wait for her to announce her candidacy for president so that I could lead the charge to take her down. You wonder why I was so eager to stomp on her in 2017 before she had even announced her candidacy. Back when people were still saying she's going to be sen staying senator for at least a full term. Why it was that I could not wait to get on her case It's because I know an animal when I see one. Well, human trafficking is a crime that we've been talking a lot about. There's actually some very exciting legislation being proposed right now by uh, Assemblyman Sandre Swanson out of, of Oakland to address the fact that uh, when it is a girl, a young girl under the age of 18 who is being trafficked, the law should not require that we prove that she was forced, physically forced, to do that thing that she is being essentially um, forced to do. Did you hear what she said? There's some exciting legislation regarding human trafficking where we don't have to prove that the victim was forced. Exciting legislation. Typically, whenever you hear some individual standing before a group talking about something, information that's exciting to them, it's usually a scientist saying that there's an exciting breakthrough in the field of medicine or the field of physics. You got a prosecutor here who's holding all the cards, might I add who's saying that it's exciting that there's some new punishment laws on the books. So I stand here as a career prosecutor, a very proud career prosecutor. And by way of background, I will tell you, I'm also one of two children who was born to parents who met when they were graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley in the 1960s. Do you know the challenge for every law enforcement leader, every elected district attorney, every elected sheriff, the challenge and the concern, the fear, always, is that we will do something with that low-level offender that might be about education and less incarceration, job training, mental health, and that person will go out tomorrow and kill a baby and a grandmother. And then everyone will look at us and they will say, Madam District Attorney, Mr. Police Chief, Mr. Sheriff, why did you do something different with them when you had them? Because you see, when we engage in innovation in law enforcement, it necessarily means we're doing something different with someone who's on our screen, on our radar. And the only reason they're probably there is because they committed some kind of crime. Very interesting analyses by then California Attorney General Harris in this case. She talks about the necessity of analyzing these low-level offenders and how every law enforcement official lives in fear that if you try to let some low-level offender off the hook, well, next week they'll turn around and commit an even bigger crime. Now, notice while she's going through all of this kvetching and all of this preemptive worrying, she never talks about the police. 
She never talks about the police who murder people all the time, who assault and rape people all the time, who frame people all the time. Hey, if you deal with some patrol officer who's being accused of misconduct early, you can stop him before he decides that he's going to kill Oscar Grant. Or before they decide to frame someone for a murder they didn't commit. Notice how that never comes up, because apparently the police don't commit any crimes in Kamala Harris's world. In the imagination of Kamala Harris, the police walk on water and they only do good deeds, and we certainly don't need to look at the police through the exact same lens of criminality that we look at, say, the black community. This is who was supposed to be the top cop in California. Now, this next part that Kamala Harris is going to be laughing and guffawing about is particularly important because she has tried and failed to rebrand herself as a progressive prosecutor. That's the phrase she liked to use, kind of like George W. Bush's compassionate conservatism, another lie made slogan. Kamala Harris talking about herself as a progressive prosecutor, progressive prosecutor. Well, Kamala Harris is going to tell you exactly what she thought about progressives back when she was attorney general because she didn't start talking that progressive prosecutor crap until she wanted to run for the senate and she needed to find a way to preemptively whitewash her 25 to 30 years of crimes against the black community so i'm gonna let kamala harris tell you what she thought about progressive prosecutors when she was in front of other da's back when she thought that she had a friendly audience and that nobody was gonna dig this video up Okay, so I say with all love and warmth <laughs> that part of the concern also for people who, um, who are progressive thinking and liberal minded or just progressive thinking in terms of just fix it, fix it, is that we all have these posters in our closet that is attached to a stick that we sometimes will card out when we're talking about criminal justice policy and those statistics that you first heard when we opened it up, incarceration, and we run around with these signs, build more schools, less jails. Build more schools, less jails. And we walk around everywhere, build more school. we protest, build more schools, less jails. Put money into education, not prisons. There's a fundamental problem with that approach, in my opinion, and it's this. I agree with that conceptually, but you have not addressed the reason I have three padlocks on my front door. See how mocking she was. See how derisive she was. She has utter contempt for people who think that maybe the prison industrial complex is a bad thing. I mean, look at how she was just mocking them. This is how she mocks progressives. This is how she mocks liberals. As far as she's concerned, you're trying to put me out of a job. Oh, look at these people with their little signs. Build more schools, not jails. Man, Michael Bloomberg and Rudy Giuliani couldn't have said that crap any better. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the third. he couldn't have mocked liberals any worse than Kamala Harris did. And this is supposed to be what passes for a progressive prosecutor? A woman who lampoons and mocks and derides and ridicules the very progressives who are trying to tell her the problem is that you can either build schools, you can build jails. And while she's busy talking about statistically proven, scientifically proven stats, there's another stat that's also been scientifically proven. Every time you close a school, you have to build a prison. There is literally a one-to-one -one correlation between the two. But notice how that little factoid never makes it into Kamala Harris's analyses. That never makes it into her speeches. She is very concerned about truancy, but she isn't concerned about building more schools. Though she'll be damned if you're going to tell her that she can't build more jails. After all, where is she going to get her free slave labor to protect the homes of her rich white pals who live up in the hills of California? So part of the discussion about reform of criminal justice policy has to be an acknowledgement that crime does occur. And especially when it is violent crime and serious crime, well, there should be a broad consensus that there should be serious and severe and swift consequence to crime. Unless it's the police, or Willie Brown, or Steve Mnuchin, or Brock Turner. 
2005, in a secret memo, D.A. Harris's aides recommended that she enact a policy that many prosecutors have been enacting nationwide to disclose past misconduct by law enforcement in order to help ensure defendants received a fair trial. Kamala Harris refused. Her first loyalty wasn't to the people of San Francisco. It was to upholding white supremacy and to protect the enforcement arm of white supremacy. But notice that the police unions oppose defendants knowing the dirt that they've done. Gee, you know, if you obey the law, then you got nothing to worry about, right? But that's the entire point. Now, the fact that this has not been standard operating procedure nationwide proves the farce of American justice, because the Constitution allegedly gives defendants the right to confront their accusers. And in most cases, especially those where there's only circumstantial evidence, the only accusers are the police, because there's no one else and nothing else to do it. So a defendant ought to know everything they can about their accuser in order to mount a vigorous defense, right? The San Francisco Public Defender's Office had long been demanding that the police's personnel records be open to defense counsels. And now we know that Kamala Harris's own DA staff had been demanding that she do the same thing. So Kamala was defying not only the city's public defender's office, not only the public, she was also defying her own prosecutor's office as well. So much for For the People. January 1st, 2009, Oscar Grant is murdered by a San Francisco transit race soldier, Johann Meserly. Kamala Harris says nothing. September 2009, Matrice Richardson is snatched off the streets by L.A. Sheriff's deputies. They claim to have released her in the early morning hours. It would be four months before the police and sheriffs finally decide to call for a search to find her. Her dead body would eventually be located in a creek bed. She was found totally naked, but her death was not ruled a homicide. And, of course, the white police ruled out any chance of foul play. But the family of Matrice Richardson, particularly her father, wasn't having it, and so he would begin his own crusade to get justice for his daughter, one that Kamala Harris would categorically ignore. 2010. The drug lab for the San Francisco Police Department had a technician who was a drug addict. She had been using the cocaine that had been seized for her own personal needs, and she was also systematically mishandling the evidence. This scandal led to a number of drug cases having to be dismissed. But the main question was, what did D.A. Kamala Harris know about all this and when did she know it? Because it was obvious that D.A. Harris had been deliberately hiding the problems in the drug lab from the defendants who her office was prosecuting. The courts were certainly interested in knowing how much Kamala Harris knew about this corruption. In 2010, a court ruled that D.A. Harris's office violated the constitutional rights of countless defendants by hiding what they knew about the tainted drug evidence. Jamal Trulove is convicted of a 2007 murder that he didn't commit. The only eyewitness was a paid stooge who the police used to frame Trulove. There were all manner of procedural irregularities with the case against Jamal Trulove, but San Francisco DA Kamala Harris saw a chance to put yet another black man behind bars, and she wasn't going to miss out. She praised the lying witness and the lying police as being brave. Jamal Trulove would later provide documented evidence that the San Francisco police gave the false witness over $60,000 in housing and utilities and even meals for her false testimony. Trulove was granted a second trial in 2015, and this time he was acquitted and the police frame was exposed. Earlier this year, Jamal Trulove settled his lawsuit against the city of San Francisco for over $13 million. But he lost six years of his life in prison for a murder that he didn't commit. And no matter what, his name will always be associated with that. When a black man is acquitted, that never gets as much attention as a conviction. And did Kamala Harris at any point acknowledge the framing of Jamal Trulove? Did she ever express 
even a scintilla of regret for having praised a liar who perjured herself on the stand? Did Kamala Harris express any remorse or sympathy for Jamal True Love? Did she so much as apologize, even once? No. 2011. Kamala Harris runs for California Attorney General and wins. Kevin Cooper, who had been on death row for a murder he didn't commit, had been petitioning the state to allow for advanced DNA testing. Kamala Harris, as Attorney General, refused. It was only in 2018, as she was gearing up for her failed presidential campaign, that a New York Times article shamed her into having to speak on the issue, and she made an insincere and one-time mention that California ought to allow for such DNA testing. She's no longer attorney general and hence no longer able to do anything about it. She now decides that DNA testing would be a good idea. 2013, Steve Mnuchin's One West Bank ran one of the largest mortgage scams in America. Prosecutors in Kamala Harris's own attorney general's office had found over a thousand violations of foreclosure laws and wrote an internal memo to Attorney General Harris recommending that she pursue litigation against Mnuchin. Kamala Harris declined. Steve Mnuchin, as you know, is now the Treasury Secretary of the United States under President Donald Trump. And how often has Kamala Harris in her role as senator decided to get into spitball fights with Steve Mnuchin? She hasn't. She declined to challenge Steve Mnuchin. Gee, I wonder why. And speaking of declining to do her job, in March of 2013, Kamala Harris also declined to enforce Proposition 8, the gay marriage ban that had been passed by California voters. And her excuse? She said that as attorney general, she can use discretion as to what cases she goes to court over and which ones she ignores. Even though there had been no Supreme Court determination on Proposition 8's constitutionality, Kamala Harris, on her own, declared that she felt that Proposition 8 violated the Constitution. Not because the court said so, but because that's what she thought about it. June 2013, after an appeals court rules that Proposition 8 must be suspended pending a Supreme Court ruling, Kamala Harris starts showing what she thinks about gay marriage by officiating gay weddings. It's clear that she's trying to get her gay donor support in a row as she prepares to run for higher office, but I want you to think about that. As Attorney General, she's supposed to be a neutral observer of the law. And she's not supposed to be out in public being a blatant activist for anything. That shows clear and open bias. Any cases that she was involved with ought to have been thrown out because of the fact that this woman clearly is operating with an open bias. But that's not what happened. Now, regardless of what anyone may think about gay marriage, there is no debating the fact that the voters, the people of California, held a plebiscite amongst themselves and they said that they were not in favor of gay marriage, and they even passed a law. This was a pure expression of public will. Now, if you don't like that law, then you must have a constitutional basis upon which to challenge it. You can't just say, because I said so. Keep in mind, the Supreme Court would not rule on gay marriage until 2015, and yet in 2013, the so-called Attorney General of California was officiating gay weddings. And San Francisco City Hall was lighting up the front of their building in multicolor lights, something they have never done for black people in any shape, form, or fashion. Now you know where Barack Obama, the country's first gay president, got the idea from. All this because Kamala Harris declared she didn't care what the law said. She would pick and choose when the law applied. That she would do her job when it suited her. This is a blatant admission of corruption. 2014. Michael Walker was an innocent man who the LAPD framed for burglary with no evidence whatsoever, and the LAPD, working in direct concert with the LADA's office, never even brought Walker to trial. Instead, they just kept him locked up behind bars, because they knew if they had to prove he was guilty, they couldn't. They had no evidence. You cannot imprison someone without them being charged, and without them having their day in court. 
Walker's constitutional rights had been flagrantly violated, and the LADA's office fought to keep violating his rights all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, it wasn't because the LADA's office thought that the Supreme Court was going to nullify the Fourth Amendment, even for black people. It was because the LADA's office was determined not to admit that they were wrong. In 2014, Walker won a pitifully small jury verdict against his persecutors, but what he didn't get was the support of then-Attorney General Kamala Harris. Her office should have immediately swept down on the LAPD and the LADA's office for prosecutorial misconduct and police corruption. This is an open and shut case. If there was ever a ridiculously obvious example of police and prosecutorial misconduct, this would be it. But Kamala Harris not only refused to hold the police and prosecutors accountable, she didn't even say one piddling word about the persecution of Michael Walker. But then again, why would she? She made her political bones doing the exact same things. And speaking of mistreating prisoners and violating constitutional rights, Federal judges later that year would tell Kamala Harris's office that she must release as many nonviolent offenders as possible because the prisons in California were so overcrowded that it constituted a violation of the Constitution. Under California law, they have a two-for-one policy for nonviolent offenders who are on some, anything under a third strike. That means nonviolent offenders only have to serve half their sentence before they become eligible for parole. Kamala Harris and her office fought this all the way to the Supreme Court, not because they thought it was against the law, not because they thought it was a threat to public safety, but because Kamala Harris was using the prisons as her own forced labor. As wildfires burned through California, Attorney General Kamala Harris was determined to risk as many lives as she had to to protect the homes of the wealthy white people who she depended on for donations. You see, it's those wealthy white folk who live up in the hills. Because these wealthy white people wanted to be far as possible away from the plebes down in the cities. So instead of letting these guys pay for their own fire protection, instead it's a matter of, nah, let's force the public to foot the tab and let's force prisoners to do what these wealthy white people should be doing for themselves. But Kamala Harris figured she could get around having to pay people to fight the fires by using inmates as slave labor, so she arbitrarily extended the prisoners' sentences by refusing to release them from prison. This is a clear-cut violation of the Constitution, not because I say so, but because the courts ruled so. Many of these defendants challenged Attorney General Harris's little edict, and her office went to court to defend their right to use slave labor. The court documents show the feculent excuse that her office used to try to keep her deadly scam going. As her office put it, they had a hard time finding inmates who would be eligible to be used as firefighters. And the reason that it had to be low-level nonviolent offenders is because this pool of slave labor that Kamala Harris was forcing to go into these deadly situations, they were going to be in close proximity to these wealthy white landowners' homes. And she wanted to make sure that it was individuals who were the least likely to cause these wealthy white landowners who she would be depending on for donations any sort of problems. So that's the reason why it had to be low-level nonviolent offenders. Even though the two-for-one credits were state policy, Harris wanted to be allowed to disregard this because using inmates was cheaper than paying people, and in the most damning confession of all, her office admitted on, in documented records that fighting fires was strenuous and risky and that prisoners refused to do it. They were forcing people into slave labor, and they admitted it. And yet Kamala Harris ran for re-election as California Attorney General and won. Because in California, the only opinion that matters are the wealthy white ones. And by the way, in 2014, Kamala Harris still didn't give a two-bit damn about Matrice Richardson. 2015, San Francisco police murder Mario Woods. 
The San Francisco DA's office tried to bury the investigation and refused to prosecute the police for this murder. The family of Mario Woods pleads to Attorney General Kamala Harris to prosecute the police at the state level. Attorney General Harris refused, saying that she wasn't going to overrule local prosecutors. Gee, so much for whenever black mothers are crying about their dead child, they could always run to Kamala and count on her to do something. So much for listening to the bereaved parents of murdered black children, huh? Again, Kamala Harris made it clear that she wants those police union votes and she would gladly offer up black people as human sacrifices to white supremacy. That year, U.S. Senator Barbara Boxer is getting ready to leave the Senate. Kamala Harris began putting together her own campaign to run for the job, and her old sugar daddy, low-down Willie Brown, was giving her the golden nod. Former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa had been preparing his own campaign to run for Barbara Boxer's seat, but Willie Brown told him that his pet thought had already been given the job, so there was no vacancy there which means that the San Francisco political machine was behind her, so Villaraigosa just needed to sit this one out. You see, office holders are not elected. They are selected by the moneyed powers that be, which are white supremacy's administrative arm. 2016, Attorney General Harris begins her campaign for the U.S. Senate, and as part of her cynical strategy, she was suddenly very concerned about the Matrice Richardson murder, and she reversed her office's prior position, announcing that she was opening an investigation into the murder just in time for the election. Matrice Richardson's father called out this stunt for the obvious fraud it was. It was clear to everyone that she was just trying to fool the black community into thinking she wasn't our enemy. And this worm, Kamala Harris, had the gall to use a murdered black girl as a pawn to get some quickie headlines in order to gain some black votes. Kamala Harris won the Senate election in November of 2016, and a month later, as she was preparing to vacate her office as Attorney General, she quietly, very quietly, put out a statement that her office was dropping the investigation of the Matrice Richardson murder for the second time because there just wasn't enough evidence of a crime. 2017. From the moment she was sworn in, Kamala Harris began copying Barack Obama's strategy of getting into pointless, meaningless spitball fights with Trump administration officials, except for Steve Mnuchin, who she had let off the hook years earlier. And she was doing this in order to force the white media to cover her and put her into the news cycle. Barack Obama would do the same stunts and grandstanding when he got into the Senate in 2005, constantly bickering with Bush administration officials over nothing as a quickie way to raise his profile and gets a little bit of air time on the white media airwaves. It was obvious that Kamala Harris was vying for attention and taking every opportunity to make the white media notice her. She wasn't bothering to try to get any legislation passed. No attempts at forwarding any policies, just one media whoring stunt after the next, one pointless spitball fight with Trump administration officials after the next, and absolutely nothing being done to get tangibles for black people. There was some idle speculation about Harris running for president since she was the only other biracial in the Senate besides Cory Booker, but make no mistake— when she first arrived in Washington, the white media's curiosity about her running for higher office died pretty quickly. And for the few white media outlets who actually bothered to speculate on it, all it took was for Senator Feinstein to tell them that speculation on Harris running for president was premature because, quote, she just got here. And the white media fully accepted that deflection. And why not? It's a cute game the white media likes to play whenever there's some new member of Congress who makes a name for themselves before they get to Washington. The white media will make the rounds, opining about how long it will be before the incoming attention whore member of Congress decides to run for president. We see them doing this today with Alexandria Cortez. 
This girl was a bartender just a couple of years ago, and she has neither the experience nor the capability to be president, but she does say a lot of stupid stuff that gets headlines and attention, and with the white media, that's a lot more important than experience or capability. But while the white media was busy letting fossils like Feinstein convince them that Harris wasn't running, I could see the writing on the wall, and I knew that she was definitely going to declare her candidacy in 2019. The time was now to begin the effort to call her out before she even got started. See, that's what the black media is about. We cut the knees out from under our enemies before they get a chance to stand. We call these scumbags out before... Before they become a problem. We don't wait until danger is right in front of us. We warn you about who your enemies are years before they actually start drawing their swords against you. September 2017, I dropped my now classic video, The Deadly Deception of Kamala Harris. I laid out many of her myriad crimes against us, the former slaves of this country. I made it clear that this woman was Obama 2.0, if not worse, and how this was a direct threat to us, one that we had to be in preparation for. I wanted to start beating the drum against her hard and heavy early, because it was excruciatingly clear to me that she was going to run for president, and she would do it by replicating the Obama playbook, because in her would-be lunkhead candidacy, I saw a chance to repudiate the mistake of supporting Barack Obama that black people had made in 2008. I saw an opportunity to directly refute the white supremacist practice of using these biracial immigrant tools against us. And I knew that by taking her down, we would send a potent and powerful message. Kamala Harris's constant spitball fighting with Trump administration officials was all for show, just a feeble attempt at duplicating what Obama had done after he became a senator. And just like with Obama, Harris was merely trying to get the white media to talk about her. That's it. Kamala Harris was determined to elbow her way into the news cycle. See, Kamala Harris thought that because the white media talked about her whenever she prompted them to, that this meant the white media liked her. She figured she had learned how to play the game. Because she was so smart. She was unstoppable. Because she was getting the white media to give her attention on demand. When it came to accusing Donald Trump of colluding with Russia, Kamala Harris was making the accusations hard and heavy. She was out there yelling to beat the band. The white media would breathlessly report that she was being interrupted by Republicans whenever she would aggressively question Jeff Sessions or some other administration tool. Of course, being interrupted was exactly what Kamala Harris wanted. She wanted people to see her openly arguing with the Republicans because 99.9% .9 of the time, congressional hearings are boring as hell, so anytime members of Congress get into shouting matches or some sort of open disagreement with one another, it's guaranteed to make the news because most of the time, it's a snore fest on Capitol Hill. To Kamala Harris, the Senate hearings weren't about Russia at all. It was her political coming out party. 2018 was more of the same, but the white media wasn't fooled. It was blatantly obvious that Harris was showboating and attention whoring for the media attention, but nobody was willing to definitively say that she was getting ready to run for president, except for the black media. The white media just wasn't sure. Vogue magazine would only say that Kamala Harris was dreaming big. And then they talked about how great she was at connecting with voters. All the while, Kamala kept acting out for the cameras. It was the Mueller probe in 2017, and in 2018 it was the Kavanaugh hearings and illegal alien detention centers. She would show out for white women accusing a white man of sexual assault. She would express sympathy and support for illegal aliens who shouldn't even be here. But not a peep about black people. As 2018 drew to a close, the white media, like McClatchy, finally figured out that Harris was just using all of these spectacles at these hearings as a platform to help her fundraise for her Democratic colleagues, and what Kamala Harris expected in return was for these grateful beneficiaries to pledge their support to her when she ran for president. Now, if you had been getting your information from the black media, you would have already known all that long before. 
And it went on like this until the 2018 midterm elections, after which the primary election season officially got underway. It was at this point that Kamala Harris figured she was ready to throw her bedwench high heels into the ring. She knew that she had the donor support. She knew that she had the California political machine behind her. She knew that the white media was going to back her to the hilt. What she didn't know was that the former slaves being led by the black media was ready for her. January 2019. It would be a milestone event. The black media would officially claim its first political scalp and in the process show that we could influence presidential elections. After weeks of rampant speculation, well, rampant speculation by the white media, who's always the last to know, the event that I have been warning you about since 2017 was inevitable, finally came to pass. January 21st, 2019, Kamala Harris officially announced she was running for president. And the way that she carefully went about tiptoeing around the issues at her little announcement speech told me that she was fully aware that the black media had arrayed against her and she was trying to see if she could get out in front of some of the criticism that she knew was going to be coming and shut down the controversies before they got started. She knew that the only way she could get to the White House was to have the black vote enthusiastically in her corner. Lukewarm black support simply wouldn't be enough to get her into the Oval Office. She needed enthusiastic, overwhelming black support. Problem was, she knew that after Obama, the black vote was adamantly soured on casting our vote and then hoping for the best. The black vote was being disciplined. The black vote was being gotten in line by the new voices of black media who were preaching the message, no tangibles, no vote. We were done being taken for granted. We were also done with letting the people who made their careers off of persecuting us off the hook. We were looking to punish some of these career white supremacist tools. And she could see that we were planning to start with her. When Barack Obama declared his candidacy, he made it a point to be as race neutral as possible. In fact, he often went beyond that and attacked black people, black men in specific, in the same terms as any white conservative. The black community's anger is well known and palpable with this tactic. Kamala knew that it would be political suicide to copy Obama's strategy in this regard, so using race neutral rhetoric simply wouldn't fly with the black community this election cycle. So Kamala Harris and her white handlers decided to go for a strategy of lip service instead. She figured she'd make a perfunctory, insincere display of phony black awareness. She made an announcement at Howard University, and she did it on Martin Luther King Day, no less. The damned insult. This was meant to impress the black vote. Apparently, she thought we would be so bowled over that she went to a black university and announced her candidacy on a black man's holiday, the only one on the calendar, and she would name drop black people's names like Shirley Chisholm, and apparently we would simply forget all of her crimes. And we would also forget to vet her, and we would also forget to demand that she pledge tangibles to us. Well, at least that was her plan. See, politicians have long understood that black people are so desperate for government leaders to acknowledge our interests that we will actually imagine that they said they would do things for us when they actually didn't say anything at all. All they have to do is say something complimentary about a black person, usually Dr. King, or give the most fleeting and vague of mentions to racism that we endure every second of every day, just a small inference is all that's necessary to give, and black people's desperate imaginations will fill in these canyons. These are not blanks that we're filling in. These are not gaps we're filling in. These are canyons that we're filling in. We're sitting here imagining that they're pledging something to us because that's how desperate we were. Just so we can feel a little bit better about being utterly ignored, and the white media has a ready phalanx of black bootlicks in the media who will tell us that these phony friends are actually on our side, and we should support them, and don't ask them to do anything for you. 
because you're go oh man you're going overboard if you ask them to do something for you you're going too far why are you making demands of them oh you're just putting too much upon them ain't that what roly poly said ain't that what joy reed said Ain't that what the rest of these fakers, frauds, and phonies have said? That when black people come up to politicians with demands, well, man, y'all just putting too much upon it. Y'all, y'all just doing too much. Y'all, y'all, why wasn't y'all talking like this to so-and-so? They always do deflections and dodges. When everybody else demands tangibles, that's democracy at work. That's groups who are acting intelligently. That's political solidarity, and that, that's smart. But whenever the former slaves do it, well, you're asking these politicians to go out of their way. You're putting too much upon them. Oh, that's, that's going overboard. At least that's what the black boule bootlick class says to us. That's what they're there for. They're there to be the cheerleaders for white supremacy's hands-off policy, this benign neglect, which is anything but benign. The job of the old dead black media was to be the cheerleaders for it and to explain away white supremacy's malignancy towards us. Bill Clinton went on Arsenio Hall's show, didn't pledge tangible one to us, but Toni Morrison called him the first black president because he liked fried chicken. Skip the Truth Gates said Obama's election was the beginning of a post-racial America. Skip Gates, as you all know, later wound up with the real America in his living room, putting him in handcuffs. These are sellouts and turncoats and vipers in our community who the white supremacists have planted in our community for the sake of convincing us that these politicians are somehow doing something for us when it's obvious they're doing everything that they can to circumvent our interest. Their job is to make it where we do not coalesce our numbers and punish them for this anti-black racism. And when the political Pied Piper predictably fails to deliver, we would just go along with the lie that, well, it was the Republicans who blocked them and that there was just nothing they could do. But for all her planning and scheming, Kamala realized she would be facing some headwinds before she even made her announcement. On January 17th, just four days before Harris announced her candidacy, the New York Times, in an act of accidental journalism, published an entire article entitled, Kamala Harris Was Not a Progressive Prosecutor. Nice to see the white media finally picked up on what the black media had been saying for years. Kamala's entire political ploy was to brand her West Coast Jim Crow tactics as being a progressive prosecutor. She would talk progressively whenever she was in front of black folks, but as soon as she was in front of those white folks, especially white prosecutors, it was all about how we need to be tougher on these black folks. She figured she'd rebrand herself and that that would cover up her crimes, but the work we had been doing helped to set the table for the New York Times pulling up the rear, who had to have known what the black sentiment was regarding Kamala Harris online, and they felt compelled to mention it, but only once, mind you. The Times, and what's a rarity for them, actually did their job. They didn't embellish any of it. They didn't really give any sort of opinion or commentary. They simply listed the facts and gave the logical conclusion that there was nothing progressive about how Kamala Harris went about being a prosecutor. They listed just a few of the instances where she broke the law, suborned perjury, covered for police brutality, refused to prosecute the police for framing innocent people, fought to keep innocent people in prison, or to force people who had served their time to remain incarcerated anyway, pushed and praised laws that targeted black mothers, forced convicts into slave labor, opposed holding police accountable, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. Letting Wall Street crooks like Steve Mnuchin off the hook, that's just the tip of the very large, very ugly iceberg. But since it was the New York Times, that meant that it would at least be seen by the rest of the white media and increase the chances that someone in their ranks would ask her about it, which is exactly what happened during her announcement at Harvard. During her Q&A at Harvard, the very first question was from some goofball asking about why she didn't stop the California Bureau of Prisons from prohibiting sex change operations for inmates. So um, I was, as you, as you are rightly pointing out, the Attorney General of California for two terms, and I had a host of clients that I was ob obligated to defend and represent, and um, I couldn't fire my clients. 
and there were unfortunately situations that um, occurred where my clients took positions that were contrary to my beliefs. And, um, and there, it was an office of a lot of people who um, would do the work on a daily basis. And do I wish that sometimes they would have personally consulted me before they wrote the things that they wrote? Yes, I do. But the bottom line is the buck stops with me. And I take full responsibility for what my office did. But on that issue, I will tell you, I vehemently disagree and, in fact, worked behind the scenes to ensure that the, the Department of Corrections would um, allow transitioning inmates to receive the medical attention that they required, they needed, and deserved. The statement that you just heard Kamala give, that set the frame for exactly how she would respond to everything regarding her time as a prosecutor, from Alameda County to San Francisco DA to California Attorney General. This statement was her own rehearsed practice set of lies and dodges and word salad that she would use as a catch-all meant to help her talk around the various crimes she had committed throughout her 30-year career of lawlessness. And that answer that she gave, it would apply to everything. She could use the exact same words and reply to everything that she would be accused of. Hey, Kamala Harris, what about all the people who you let the police frame and put behind bars. Well, um, I have to represent my clients and um, I don't always agree with my clients. Well, hey, what about the prisoners who you violated their rights by keeping them behind bars even though it violated the Constitution? Well, the Bureau of Prisons, one of my clients, and well, I can't fire my clients and um, I, even if I disagree with them, I'm bound to represent them. And Hey, how about the prisoners who you forced to work as slave labor to fight fires protecting rich white people's homes? You notice how she can use that answer for everything. That's what it was meant to be. It was meant to be a rhetorical shield. Now, while the subject of the question itself was the epitome of being asinine, it did, however, show exactly where Kamala Harris's mind was whenever somebody would confront her about how she went about being a prosecutor and specifically how it was that she didn't do anything regarding the Bureau of Prisons. Kamala Harris would tap dance around the subject, but in doing so, she tipped her hand that she was fully aware that her progressive prosecutor shtick wouldn't fly. As you saw, she claimed helplessness. There was nothing she could do. Why, the Bureau of Prisons was one of her clients. And she couldn't fire her clients, so even though she personally may not have been in favor of it, but notice that she didn't say that she wasn't in favor of prohibiting sex change operations or that she wasn't on the side of the Bureau of Prisons. She just simply said, well, they're my client and I can't fire my clients. She didn't say that she disagreed with them. Notice the weasel words. She just said she had no choice but to represent their position because it's not like she can pick and choose who she represents in her official capacity as a prosecutor, and she can't choose what laws to enforce either. My, how different this Kamala Harris sounds from the one who was telling everybody back in 2013 that it was in her discretion, her complete discretion, as to whether or not she would enforce Proposition 8 and she would refuse to enforce Proposition 8 because she felt that it was unconstitutional. That's something for a court to decide, not a, not a prosecutor. But Kamala Harris decided, well, I've decided I'm not going to enforce Proposition 8 because I don't like it and I have discretion. It is in my discretion. I can choose. And yet, here we are six years later and she's saying exactly the opposite. Why? It's not like I can choose. So let me get this straight. The Bureau of Prisons is one of her clients, but the people of California, who you would think would be her most important client, certainly her largest constituency, she doesn't feel compelled to stand up for what they say unless it suits her. Otherwise, she'll ignore it and she'll tell them to their faces, I don't like it, so I'm not going to enforce this. But the Bureau of Prisons, hey, whatever the Bureau of Prisons wants, the Bureau of Prisons gets. Locking people up, keeping them incarcerated illegally to the point that it violates the Constitution, done. She'll go to the mat to represent that. She'll go to the mat to fight for that. Hey, using inmates as slave labor, forcing them into, to risk their lives to protect white, wealthy white people's homes. Oh, she'll go to the mat for that. But when the 
population of California says no gay marriage, we're not having it here, I'm not enforcing that. I have discretion. This woman has a forked tongue, and you can see it getting tied in knots. She also said she wished her subordinates consulted with her on the things that they did. Well, her subordinates informed her about the necessity to prosecute Steve Mnuchin on his scam, One West Bank, and she refused. Her subordinates also told her that she needed to make police personnel records available to defendants in San Francisco, and she refused. So pretending as if no one was telling her anything, that's just another Kamala Harris lie. Well, if Kamala Harris thought that the New York Times was being harsh with her, nothing could have prepared her or that kindergarten she called her campaign for what the black media would do to her. We rain down on her like the wrath of God. The black media and those ideological fellow travelers who were the new voices of black media all spoke in one undeniable voice that Kamala Harris is the enemy of the black community. On YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, comment sections, it was undeniable and unavoidable. And the white media saw this storm of revulsion by the black media, and there was two main themes that became evident. Something that had been taking shape for over 10 years but came to a head during Obama's first term. There were black people pointing out that Obama's immigrant ancestry was clearly more important to him than being black, and also that as a people, we have political interests, and at the top of that list are tangibles. Harris had no way to defend or deflect against the storm of truth that was raining down on her. What happened was her would-be supporters in the white media were helpless to stem the tide. Everyone was seeing it. Everyone was talking about it. Kamala Harris got knocked on her butt as soon as she made her announcement. In fact, the white media was scrambling to find some sort of excuse, some sort of deflection or dodge for it. They just went to the only thing that they could think of to say, uh, well, well, maybe it's Vladimir Putin behind this. That lets you know exactly how hard the black media hit her. We hit her so hard, they thought the Russians did it. We had proven that we could successfully take control of the news cycle, not by getting airtime on some white media outlet, not by trying to think if we write a couple of pieces for the Huffington Post, or if we can get a mention in the New York Times that somehow that means we're in the news cycle. The news cycle starts at the grassroots. If the people at the grassroots are listening to you and not listening to the New York Times, then it doesn't matter what the New York Times has to say. That's a pig simple reality that is not lost on the black media, though it is lost on some interested media moguls cheerleading squad. Now, tangibles have been criticized by some ignorant people as not being specific enough as a term in and of itself. But when you have angry black people demanding political policies that address black economics exclusively, the only word that comes to mind is reparations. That's the first word that comes to mind. This set the frame for how the white media would be forced to address reparations because that was the easiest thing for them to glom onto. Kamala got into the race very early and the white media, having no other candidate of real note to talk about, gave her the attention she craved. January 22nd. Only 24 hours after Kamala Harris made her little Howard University PR stunt announcement, her campaign was already feeling the heat from the black media, raining down on her heavier than she ever thought it could, and the white media was powerless to blunt the force of our attack. Facing this crisis this early in the campaign, Kamala Harris's official minister of disinformation, I mean, uh, miscommunications director, Lily White, otherwise known as Lily Adams, decided that the smart play would be to try to pander to black people as if they're all a bunch of world star hip hop rejects, showing exactly how much disrespect and contempt that Kamala and her advisors have for the very black people whose votes they desperately needed. This is disrespectful as hell and deliberate. It lets you know what Kamala Harris really thinks about black people. And it was as much a message to her white handlers and benefactors as it is to black people. 
It's to make it clear to them, hey, I'm not really with this, but this is kind of what these Negroes expect. What, you think Hillary Clinton liked dancing a jig with roly-poly Martin? No. But this is what Kamala Harris's pasty white handlers told her to do because this is what's going to fool black people. We, we got to do something hip. Don't do anything honest because honesty is beneath you. But go ahead and do something pandering and see if it works. This stunt was so excruciatingly awful to watch when I saw it. I cringed so hard I almost broke my own back. This clown Kamala Harris and her white handlers actually expect us to believe that this is some sort of peek behind the scenes and that when nobody's looking, Kamala Harris is dancing very awkwardly to Cardi B? Cardi B is a fellow immigrant and also an anti-black racist, so while I can believe that Kamala Harris is able to identify with trash like Cardi B, what I cannot believe is that she does anything that identifies people, specifically the descendants of American slaves. That I cannot believe. And as for her ridiculous attempt at dancing, it makes perfect sense that she's not very good at it. The closest to dancing that Harris is used to is doing the horizontal tango with old low-down Willie Brown. If she expected this to win over black voters, it didn't. In fact, it highlighted just how disrespectful and patronizing she is. We demand tangibles. We demand an end to the criminal injustice system against us. And what does she do? She decides Cardi B is the answer. Her attempts at giving some insincere lip service to hip-hop and thinking that that would win black voters failed. But having no black agenda to offer us, this was the only card she could play. See, family, this is what I mean when I tell you that the white media can give you a platform, but what they cannot give you is legitimacy. The black media may not have as large a platform as the white one, but we've got the legitimacy. Kamala Harris's numbers in the polls had a slight uptick in February, mostly due to the fact that no one else of note had entered the race yet. Kamala had the field to herself, but even so, she was hardly setting the world on fire. It was especially embarrassing when the white media was forced to report that the only high-profile candidate in the 2020 primary race simply couldn't get black support. Her millions of dollars in campaign money and endless white media adulation simply wasn't able to distract black voters from her reprehensible record. Nobody was forgetting about the fact that she had spent the previous 25 plus years persecuting black people and breaking countless laws in the process. Black people were listening to the black media. This was a terrifying new development for the white media and a horrifying one for Kamala Harris. February 11th, 2019. It's no coincidence that Kamala Harris's polling was at its highest level up to that point around early to mid-February. Neither Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, nor Joe Biden had entered the presidential race. Yet. Even so, all the polls threw Sanders, Warren, Biden in their polling data anyway, since it was clear that all three of them would be running. Kamala Harris was in third place when compared to them, which at that time was higher than Elizabeth Warren. But Kamala realized she had a huge problem with the black vote, namely that she wasn't able to get it. So she decided to go on the breakfast schlubs, I mean the breakfast club, and the three spokes coons who host that side show shucked and jived and yucked it up with her. It was a pathetic and totally disgraceful display of their utter contempt and hatred for the black community. While black people online were making it clear what our concerns are and that reparations was the word, the breakfast schlubs brought Kamala on, laughed as she talked about smoking weed and pretended that she listened to rappers in college when these guys weren't even in the music business yet and dodged the issue of reparations and they let her get away with all of that because after all, that's their job. These step-and-fetch-it Negroes who the white media puts in radio stations or on TV, they are every bit as complicit in helping white supremacy undermine us as the bootlicks and boule garbage like Kamala Harris who run for political office. These guys are both on the same team. They understand that they're working together. And to delegitimize Kamala Harris would be to delegitimize themselves. 
Charlemagne the Fraud thought he was cleverly helping insulate Harris from criticism, but in reality he was only making her situation worse. The black media dragged Harris on her obvious lies and obfuscations and also plastered the breakfast schlubs with knowingly collaborating with an anti-black racist running for president. They didn't ask any tough questions because Harris is incapable of standing up to scrutiny. Kamala Harris's word salad BS routine only works if the person asking the question lets it fly, which the breakfast schlubs did. We're demanding our tangibles, calling her out for 30 years of using her position as a prosecutor to persecute us, and they think it's all fun and games? What the breakfast schlubs did that day is treason. Full stop. Both Bernie the Bigot Sanders and Elizabeth Warren formally announced their candidacies for president. This sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room for Harris, because she now must compete against actual opponents and not hypothetical ones. Although the full impact of their entering the race would not be evident on her, her numbers do start to slide. She's still above Elizabeth Warren in the polls, but Harris would correct that little oversight just a few days later. February 24th, 2019. It's very rare that you can actually chronicle the exact moment that a politician commits political suicide, but on February 24th, following weeks of non-stop excoriation by the black media and weeks of seeking out friendly outlets to talk to, Kamala Harris figured that she would talk to the primary LGBT advocacy website, The Grio. Maybe she figured that nobody would see it, since the griot isn't big or influential, so it wouldn't matter. Now, since I'm sure that some members of the Byron Allen fan club will be lurking in the comments section, let's take on this issue head on. Nobody can say for sure whether or not Byron Allen is to credit for this interview, but it would be intellectually dishonest not to mention that it was the Griot's interview with Kamala Harris where she was pegged down on whether she supported reparations. But let's not make a saint out of a sinner. It would be equally intellectually dishonest to try to give Byron Allen credit for something he had never done before and would not do since. I'm far more inclined to believe that this was a case of one reporter for that website who had gone off the reservation as opposed to this being Byron Allen's doing because the Grio had not been on a tear about re reparations or tangibles before and they haven't been on one since. But regardless, the Grio asked Kamala Harris about what she would do for black people. What's her black agenda? And Kamala Harris came unglued. Do you support reparations for black people? Well, listen, again, we had over 200 years of slavery. We had Jim Crow for almost a, a, a century. We had legalized discrimination, segregation, and now we have it, it, segregation and discrimination that is not legal but still exists and is a barrier to progress. We have disparities around housing. We have disparities around education. We have disparities around income. And we have to recognize that everybody did not start out on an equal footing in this country. And in particular, black people have not. And so we have got to recognize that and do something about that and give folks a lift up. That's why, for example, I'm proposing the LIFT Act. Give people who are making $100,000 or less as a family a tax credit which will benefit and uplift 60% of black families who are in poverty. So by default, it affects black families, but there's not a particular policy for African Americans that you would explore. But no, if you look at the, the reality of who will benefit from certain policies, when you take into account that they're not starting at, at, at the same place and they're not, stand, they're not starting on equal footing, it will directly benefit black children, black families, black homeowners because the disparities are so significant. So if we focus on the specific issues that have resulted in the greatest disparities, and we understand that that's part of why we're doing it. Listen, the, the reality also is this. Any policy that will benefit black people will benefit all of society. Let's be clear about that. Let's really be clear about that. So I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. 
No, because whatever benefits that black family will benefit that community and society as a whole and the country, right? She began stammering and stuttering and splaining. You can tell that she was deathly aware that her white donors and Democratic Party overlords could see this video. She knows that Massa is always just around the corner. And she also didn't want to say anything that she thought would be the deleterious to her goal of making it into the general election. So she understood that I better not say anything for black people. You can go ahead and say whatever you want for illegal aliens. You can say anything you want about health care. You can walk those back. But with black people, nah, I got to make it clear, nothing for black people, not even to get myself through an interview. She was making, she was obviously thinking how this could be used against her. So she didn't mind speaking recklessly about every other subject, but on this one, nah, she already knew that there was a line she wasn't going to cross. She began twisting her forked tongue in knots, claiming that any general program could be called a black agenda so long as black people are eligible to apply for it. No transformative change. No leveling the racial wealth disparity, just another one-size-fits-all, open-to-everyone government program that maintains the racial wealth gap. And it was in this interview where she gave the infamous no heard round the world. Now, I in particular wanted to make sure that I popularized that no, because I knew it was the perfect memorandum. So I repeated that line whenever I got a chance. I wanted you to remember it. And whenever you saw Kamala Harris, whenever you read about her, I wanted you to associate her with that word no. The white media lets her get away with word salad. Black boot licks like the breakfast schlubs let her get away with it. She's been skating by for decades because nobody had ever actually pinned her down on the issues. And she refused to give interviews to anyone who she feared would. That's the reason why she didn't have a problem hanging out with Big Bird. So when she finally got caught out on this one, she didn't know what to say. And when you look at Kamala's polling, you can see that her numbers went into a nosedive after she did this interview. Kamala Harris's mouth had destroyed her campaign, and she knew it. But make no mistake, what the Grio was doing was not acting, it was reacting to what the black media had been doing. We set the table for the New York Times. We set the table for the Grio. These guys were not doing this of their own accord, because where the hell were they when we were out there doing the work? No, they were reacting to the firestorm of revulsion and objections that we had raised. Do not let the tail wag the dog, not on this one. April 2019, Joe Biden formally announces his candidacy. Kamala Harris's poll numbers slip further. By the end of May, Kamala Harris's numbers had fallen from a high of 15% in February to only 7% by May 31st. She had lost 50% of the people who said they would support her. And her fundraising for the second quarter of 2019 was about what it was for the first quarter. She wasn't gaining any new donors, particularly not small donors who are usually voters. And she had lost half of her voter support. She realized that her sick, vile attempt to rebrand herself as a progressive prosecutor had failed. Her attempts to talk around this reality had also failed. Her word salad, the blizzard of blithering that she put out, wasn't going to distract from or fool anyone. The white media couldn't distract the black voters from her record, and the black bootlicks for the white media couldn't whitewash it for her either. The black media had taken control of Kamala Harris's campaign, and we were going to run it into the ground. June 8th, Kamala Harris's campaign is already in deep, deep trouble. Elizabeth Warren has now risen to third place at this point and, in fact, is up by four percentage points. Harris's pass as a prosecutor is killing her, so she has to do something about it and fast. She can't run from it, so she instead decides to try to make her injustice record into a positive. So she decided to try to go to the old civil rights retreads, thinking that they would be a friendly audience. 
After all, these guys were nothing more than apparatuses created by white supremacy, so of course they were going to stand behind her for a photo op and they would help try to give her some optics that would be beneficial. It had worked before. It certainly worked for Ralph Northam, but Kamala Harris didn't realize she's not white. And the fact that Kamala Harris ran to the NAACP, that was no accident. The stunts that she had tried dancing, sort of, to Cardi B and going to the breakfast schlubs, that's because she was trying to reach a young black audience, because young black people were the ones who had put Barack Obama in the White House. It wasn't the old black folks, not the old guard, not the black baby boomers. It was young black people who did it. But she realized that the black media had the ear of young black people, so now she was reduced to go into the old standby, the desiccated fossils from the black baby boomers. Talk about the right tools for the right job. She went to the NAACP, which is nothing more than a boule convention full of a bunch of do-nothing senior citizens who cannot bring out the vote. On June 8th, she talked to them and even posted this pitiful speech on YouTube that she called my record as a prosecutor. But in reality, it was just more of her splaining that everyone loved her and she was only tough on gangbangers. And so being raised in this environment, in this community, and with my Uncle Sherman as one of my heroes, I decided I wanted to be that person that people would call on, that people would look to for help and to solve their problems. I wanted to be somebody who could have a role that would be about protecting people and fixing what went wrong. I know, and I knew then, prosecutors have not always done the work of justice. There have been prosecutors that refuse to seat black jurors, refuse to prosecute lynchings, disproportionately condemned young black men to death row, and looked the other way in the face of police brutality. I was clear-eyed that prosecutors were largely not people who looked like me, or my Uncle Sherman, or the people who grew up in our neighborhood. In fact, when I became a prosecutor, I was only one of a handful of black prosecutors in that office, the Alameda County DA's office. And when I was elected district attorney of San Francisco in 2003, there were only three black elected DA's in the entire country. And when I was elected attorney general of the state of California, a state of 40 million people, there was no other black attorney general anywhere else in the country. And yet, I knew, I knew the unilateral power prosecutors had with the stroke of a pen to make a decision about someone else's life or death, whether someone would be charged or let off, whether someone will be tried as a juvenile or as an adult, whether someone is sent to death row or not, I knew that it made a difference to have the people making those decisions also be the ones who went to our church, had children in our schools, coached our little league teams, and knew our neighborhoods. In South Carolina, you know this well, which is why you elected prosecutors like Byron Gibson and Chip Finney who liked the South Carolina NAACP believe in what can be, unburdened by what has been. People who bring the context, awareness, and life experience to the job to make the system more just. And I'm gonna give you just two examples of in my own career how I've seen this play out. And there are many, but I'm gonna offer two. A few years after I left Howard University, I started my job in the DA's office. And it was during the crack epidemic in the 1990s. And it was also the height of gang violence in Los Angeles. And in California then, they passed a bunch of laws that were known as gang enhancements, which meant longer sentences if a person was affiliated with a gang. And because these laws were new, prosecutors at the time were trying to figure out how to prove the cases in court. 
So one day I was sitting in my office and at the courthouse, and I heard a bunch of my coworkers outside talking. And they were talking about how they'd try to prove one of these cases, um, to prove that people, that certain, a certain person was gang affiliated. And I could hear them talking, and they were mentioning, well, look at the neighborhood the person was in. They said, well, look at the way that they were dressed. Well, look at the music they were listening to. So overhearing this conversation, I stepped out of my office. And I said, hey guys, how you guys doing? How you doing, Kamala? I said, I'm doing great. So you know, um, you know that neighborhood you were talking about? Well, I got family members and friends who live in that neighborhood. Um, you know the way that you're talking about how folks were dressed? Well, that's actually stylish in my community. And then I'm about to date myself. You know that music you were talking about? Well, I got a tape of that music in my car right now. <laughs> But the point being, it matters who's in those rooms where the decisions are being made. It matters. I'll give you another example. So years later, after I was elected district attorney as the first woman of that city and the first black woman in the state of California, again, of 40 million people, after I was elected district attorney, um, there, there, as in a lot of communities, there were homicides happening. And it was on a regular basis that mothers would come to the front window of the office. And they would arrive, and the receptionist, they would tell her, I want to talk to Kamala. I only want to talk to Kamala. I want to talk to Kamala. So the receptionist would come and get me out of my office, and I'd run to go to the front window. And of course, I knew exactly why those mothers were there. They were the mother of a murdered child. And these mothers were there for their babies because their babies were young men who had been killed by gun violence in the street. And it had been months since her son's death, and yet a killer still walked free. And I would bring them back to my office, and they would collapse in my arms and cry, and they would say, my son is dead, but yet they're not investigating the case. They don't appear to be putting resources into it. They don't appear to be taking it seriously. They are not taking my pain seriously. They are not acknowledging my pain, and my son is being treated like a statistic. And the mothers came, I believe, because they knew I would see them. And I mean literally see them. See their grief. See their anguish. See their pain. Well. Kamala Harris did incidentally speak a little bit of truth, though of course you noticed that it was highly truncated and edited. Yes, there were many black parents who came to Kamala Harris and told her that their children had been murdered, murdered by the police, and Kamala Harris did nothing. She talks about prosecutors who have misused their office in order to have innocent people put on death row, yes, like Kamala Harris did with Kevin Cooper deciding that his innocence doesn't really matter. And talking about parents who told her that their children were dead and that the authorities were not taking the parents' pain seriously, yes, like the father of Matrice Richardson, who spent years demanding that Kamala Harris go after the thugs with badges who, had t who he believed were responsible for the death of his daughter. Kamala Harris, of course, did nothing. So Kamala Harris, when she talks about people who came to her, yes, yeah, she wants to talk about people who she's obviously trying to talk around saying, well, they were gangbangers, don't you know? Yeah, but nobody asked her about gangbangers. They asked her about the thugs with badges. They asked her about all the black people who she put away, not because they were gangbangers, but because they committed small penny any crimes, but in many cases, they were framed like Jamal Truelove. 
black people who were murdered like Mario Woods. Or like the San Francisco police drug technician who, when she wasn't snorting cocaine, was tampering with evidence. See, black people came to Kamala Harris about that, too. Black people came to Kamala Harris and said, hey, these cops who have been murdering us in the streets who took the life of my child, I want to know what that bastard's service record is. I want to see his service record because I'm sure that he, this isn't the first time he's done it. And Kamala Harris said, hell no, I'm not giving you anything. Kamala Harris sided with the thugs with badges. She sided with the police when they killed black people. And now here she is in South Carolina, no less trying to get her ducks in a row, telling every lie she can. But she goes to South Carolina and she's talking about how the black community came to her because they knew that she would listen. Yeah, but they did. Nobody believed that she would do anything. Oh, she they came to me because they knew that I would see them. She didn't see the father of Matrice Richardson. She didn't see the family of Mario Woods. So that's who and what Kamala Harris is. Don't let her lie to you or fool you with this con game. This little speech was a selection of very carefully chosen words. Because she not once said, well, let me go ahead and address the case of Jamal True Love. Hey, I know you guys have been hearing about Matrice Richardson. I'm going to go ahead and address why it is that I took years, first of all, saying I wasn't going to investigate. Secondly, waiting until I ran for Senate before I said I would investigate and then dismissing any investigation later on, right after I got reelected. Let me go ahead and explain to you. No, she didn't. Instead, it's a matter of, well, I'm going to try to figure out how to make these guys believe, these dumb Negroes believe that I was just going after gangbangers. This is no different than the exact same verbal sleight of hand that you get from a Joe Biden or from a Bernie Sanders or from a Pete Buttigieg. This is the exact same game that they play, the exact same word games that they play. But Kamala wasn't done trying to talk around her reprehensible record yet. And I'll tell you, and you heard it in the introduction, I'll tell you that in this election, Regarding my background as a prosecutor, there have been those who have questioned my motivations, my beliefs, and what I have done. But my mother used to say, you don't let people tell you who you are, you tell them who you are. So that's what I'm gonna do. That's what I'm gonna do, because let me be clear. Self-appointed political commentators do not get to define who we are and what we believe. This was not some sort of speech. It was an insult. She said absolutely nothing about the very things that black people were pressing her on. She said nothing about illegally pressing inmates into forced life-threatening slave labor. She said nothing about the innocent black people that she put in prison. She said nothing about backing the police and helping them get away with framing black people and even murdering black people. She said nothing about helping career crooks like Steve Mnuchin get away with theft on an unimaginable scale. She claimed that no self-appointed pundits were going to push her around. Well, as we all know, she sure showed us, huh? This tool thought that she was the master of her own fate. In reality, the white powers that be orchestrated every little move she made. But now the black media was taking control, and we had decided that her political career had gone far enough. The black media had educated the young black vote about Kamala's record, and the fact that she refused to mention it stuck out like a sore thumb. Rather than play down her prosecutorial misconduct, she only made it more painfully, excruciatingly clear how obvious her misconduct had been. She figured if she didn't say anything about that, then no one would bring it up, that the NAACP had enough stroke that they could shut down the new voices of black media. Well, it didn't go like that. Kamala Harris's speech to the NAACP did nothing. It didn't change her poll standing in South Carolina or nationally. It did not convince any black people, young, old, or otherwise, that they needed to support her. All it did was it simply highlighted for everyone that Kamala Harris was never going to come clean on her prosecutorial record.
though it did help to confirm what we already knew that Kamala Harris and her staff were well aware of the criticism coming at her from the black media. They were aware of the deleterious impact it was having on her and that we were the ones who black voters were listening to, not the DNC, not the white media, and certainly not Kamala Harris. June 27th, the first of the Democratic debates was here. Kamala was barely qualifying to be part of the upper tier candidates, which meant she had to do something desperate and something big and noisy if she was going to save herself. She had to take down one of her opponents. She would try to get the nomination by amazing the viewers at home with her sharp wit and surgical questioning of her opponents. In other words, she would try to create some viral moments at the debate and see if that would help her standing in the polls. She decided that Joe Biden would be her target of choice. He's old, he's a gaff machine, he clearly ain't very bright. In other words, he has a lot in common with her. But she didn't go after him for authoring the 94 crime bill, which turbocharged the prison industrial complex. After all, Biden used federal money to bribe the states into changing their own state criminal statutes in order to make them as draconian as Biden's law. And Kamala Harris had made her career for decades using that exact same criminal statute. So to attack Biden would be to attack herself. So she instead decided to go after Biden on school busing. She figured that this was a safer bet than going after Biden on crime. It could, she thought, hit the same note as the racially discriminatory laws that Biden passed and that she used, only it would not open her to the exact same accusations. And so she made her pathetic plea for sympathy. She told everyone she was bussed to school. She told everyone how painful it was and how much it hurt. She ain't talking about tangibles even for herself. She's not talking about justice even for herself. Instead, it's all about, well, my feelings, my feelings. And you see, she, that's fine for her because white supremacy has gone ahead and caked her off. But what she was hoping to do was she was hoping to condition black people that when it comes to racial injustice, don't demand punishment for anyone. No one should be held accountable. No one should be punished. And you don't deserve any sort of reparations for that. If you're black, that's how it works. If you're black and you are done wrong, well, it's no harm, no foul. Everyone else has a right to redress of grievances. You just need to get over it. You can talk about how you feel, but don't make too much of it because you don't want people to be annoyed with you reminding them that you've been hurt. You, you don't want to make any enemies here. But it says a lot that after Kamala Harris tells everyone that she had been a beneficiary of school busing, that practically everyone reacted either with doubt or outright disbelief. And Kamala Harris has no one to blame for that but herself. When talking about her childhood, Kamala had never mentioned her time growing up in Oakland. She instead talked about spending time with family in Jamaica, or visiting relatives in India, or about how she had been in Canada, she had done everything she could to distance herself from black folks in America. So it was only natural that when she claims, in my childhood, I was bused to school, everybody's like, you never mentioned anything about Oakland. It was all about Jamaica and India and Canada. And this was probably one of the most disturbing moments for Harris. She didn't seem to get it that after all the lies she had told about her time in college and in the DA's office, all the lies made it where nobody was willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. It was only natural for people to doubt her when she claims that she was bused to school, because at this point, only a fool would take an inveterate liar like her at her word now. Anyway, Kamala got in the zinger of the night at the first Democrat debate, and her poll numbers had a bump for reaching what for her would be an all-time high of 20%, placing her only two points behind Biden, according to a Quinnipiac poll on July 2nd, which was the first such poll taken after her incredible debate moment. And the white media was just in orgasms, acting like she was the second coming. And the perpetually wrong CNN was posting stories saying that Kamala Harris's secret weapon was her background as a prosecutor. Never mind the fact that her past as a prosecutor was the only thing that anyone knew about her. What kind of secret is that? 
By the way, just the day before on July 1st, the New York Times ran a story with the exact same headline, only this one said that Kamala Harris's secret weapon was her college sorority. Gee, for someone with all these secret weapons, why was she sinking in the polls up until then? It just goes to show you that the white media had a program at work here. They were plagiarizing one another and not seeming to mind. CNN had Van Jones lauding her for her debate performance. He went on to say that a star is born and that she's the future of the Democratic Party. Yeah. You know, Kamala Harris had a moment that was two hours long. Right. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. she, it, I mean, a star was born. You said, you said earlier tonight at, yeah. at 8 o'clock that you yeah. were waiting for Kamala Harris was, to have her moment. You've and, known her for and listen, years. Uh, listen, a star was born tonight. Uh, this is a masterful uh, performance. Uh, she completely dominated the stage. And most importantly, she would kick Donald Trump's butt. And she proved it tonight. That was, if, if you had any doubt that you could nominate a woman that would take Donald Trump to the woodshed, she just took it away from you. My, that statement didn't age very well, now did it? But Van Jones wasn't alone in his foolishness. Joe Biden has run for president twice before and the third time won't be the charm. Many left-leaning people in the white media would like to see him gone because he is unelectable. So they praise Kamala Harris simply in the hopes that it would run the human gaff machine out of the race. It didn't. And while Kamala got a brief bump from this, as I told you, white voters in particular would not like seeing this non-white woman wagging her finger at a white man. And while Kamala may be a fan of bussing, white voters, including white Democrats, are not. She picked the wrong tool for the job. They saw her attack on Biden as being an attack on them. And while she thought that she had dodged the issue of her prosecutorial record, it would still keep coming back to haunt her in the worst way at the very next debate. July 31st, Tulsi Gabbard, who had been a marginalized contender up until this point, was also desperate to break out of the lower tier, and with the second Democratic primary debate in Detroit, she saw a chance to take down Kamala, and she would use Kamala's prosecutorial record to do it. Congresswoman Gabbard, you took issue with Senator Harris confronting Vice President Biden at the last debate. You called it a quote false accusation that Joe Biden is a racist. What's your response? I want to bring the conversation back to the broken criminal justice system that is disproportionately negatively impacting black and brown people all across this country today. Now, Senator Harris says she's proud of her record as a prosecutor and that she'll be a prosecutor president, but I'm deeply concerned about this record. There are too many examples to cite, but she put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place that impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Senator Harris, your response. As the elected Attorney General of California, I did the work of significantly reforming the criminal justice system of a state of 40 million people, which became a national model for the work that needs to be done. And I am proud of that work. And I am proud of making a decision to not just give fancy speeches or be in a legislative body and give speeches on the floor, but actually doing the work of being in the position to use the power that I had to reform a system that is badly in need of reform. That is why we created initiatives that were about reentering former offenders and getting them counseling. It Thank is you. why, and because I know that criminal justice Thank system you, is Senator. so broken, that I am an advocate for what Thank we you, need Senator. to do to your, not only decriminalize, but legalize marijuana in the United States. I want to, I want to bring uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabbard back in your response. The bottom line is, Senator Harris, when you were in a position to make a difference and an impact in these people's lives, you did not. And worse yet, in the case of those who were on death row, innocent people, you actually blocked evidence from being revealed that would have freed them until you were forced to do so. There is no excuse for that. And the people who suffered under your reign as prosecutor, oh, you owe them an apology. 
Kamala Harris simply had no answer for being confronted with her record. And clearly her staff didn't have any BS talking points to give her to talk around it either. And it was not lost on anyone that Tulsi Gabbard was getting huge applause for attacking Kamala from a Detroit audience. She was in front of the largest majority black city in America. If Kamala, the alleged black female candidate, couldn't get support in Detroit, then that just proved she was going to be toast everywhere else in the country. Tulsi Gabbard and her staff saw what the black media was saying online. All she did to crush Kamala Harris was to simply confront her in front of the nation with what we had been saying. Tulsi Gabbard understood that Kamala Harris had no black support. All she needed was a black audience to confirm it for the world. That's what Tulsi Gabbard did to Kamala Harris on July 31st. That was it. She didn't have some magic formula. She simply did the common sense thing. She saw what black folks were saying online and she leveraged this black contempt for Kamala Harris for her benefit. Again, Tulsi Gabbard, for you slow wits out there, she ain't going to do a dang thing for black people either. But I'm simply stating the facts. The fact is, Tulsi Gabbard knew exactly the right knife to use and she used it. And after Tulsi Gabbard read Kamala on live TV, Kamala's poll numbers cratered, falling from 15% in late July to only 9% a few days after the debate. Kamala tried to dismiss this humiliation as being nothing more than complaints coming from a nobody who was attacking a top-tier candidate. Problem was, after this, Kamala wasn't top-tier anything. She was a stuck pig bleeding out, and nothing would stop the bleeding. Kamala's numbers would not recover from this. And the lesson to be taken away from this is that in the two instances where Kamala Harris took her worst political damage was when the griot started talking like us and when Tulsi Gabbard used our talking points. What does that tell you? This is the reason why the white media does not want the new voices of black media anywhere near the presidential debate. Because we can take these guys down in a single moment. They know that. So as far as they're concerned, we'll talk about these guys, but everybody get on code. You do not talk to these guys. They would be absolutely radioactive to white supremacy. Kamala would go on to try to manufacture a viral moment for herself in the following Democratic debates, but it was no use. Yet what else could she do? Kamala has always been a one-trick pony. And her trick was to suck up to or on creeps like Low Down Willie Brown, or to bow and scrape for support from the thugs in blue. She hasn't cultivated any other skills. So when she really needed to think up something new, she simply can't. And so she was trapped in a rhetorical death spiral that made her campaign demise inevitable. There was simply no talking around or circumventing her 30 years of attacking the black community. No one was forgetting. No one was moving on. No one was going to let her talk around it. No amount of denials could whitewash it. No amount of endorsements from the civil rights retreads could cover it up. No amount of hangers-on from the black misleadership class and their do-nothing organizations would cause us to overlook it. Kamala's record made Democratic voters, especially the black vote, which is the base of the party, want to puke. Tulsi showed that Kamala was everything an alleged progressive cannot be, and it was also obvious to pundits and donors alike that Kamala was simply too vulnerable on her record, and that black voters and Democrats in general simply wouldn't vote for her. When a black audience in Detroit cheers at seeing a so-called black candidate get read by a non-black candidate, that tells you everything you need to know about Kamala Harris's black support. Kamala would go into the fall, a wounded animal, throwing a pity party for herself and telling the few people who would still attend her rallies that the problem is she's a woman of color. Gee, she wasn't talking like that in January or February, and she damn sure wasn't talking like that in late June after she had her moment against Biden. But there was something else going on that few people had reported on. Kamala Harris's campaign was in utter disarray internally. 
Many blamed her top staffers, but the truth is that Kamala had front-loaded her campaign with sycophants and suck-ups, like her own sister, people who had absolutely no experience or expertise in presidential campaigns. People who had never operated at this high a level before, and who had no answer to any of the political liabilities she had made for herself. Individuals who didn't want to be honest about the fact that Kamala Harris is unelectable as president. And the main reason that she's unelectable is because there is now a black media on the march to hold her accountable. No one wanted to tell Kamala Harris up until this point that her past was a problem for which there was simply no answer, and she wasn't able to lead her army of butt-kissers anywhere. All of her failings and flaws caught up to her all at once. See, the problem with Kamala Harris is that she never really had to earn a political office before. Just as she had never had to earn a job as a prosecutor, never had to earn her posting to the State Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board or the Medical Assistance Commission, Willie Brown just handed them to her. No qualifications or effort required. All she had to do was be a pretty young fang who was willing to take dictation for whatever decrepit elderly politician came along and, well, they would take care of helping her rise through the ranks. She didn't have to do anything for it and she didn't have to care about anyone's opinions because the power brokers in the San Francisco and later California political machines, their opinions were the only ones that mattered. The California political machine made Kamala Harris an assistant DA, and then a city attorney, and then DA, then Attorney General of California, and later a U.S. Senator. Willie Brown and his high-powered white pals could snap their fingers, and she would be given campaign cash and union endorsements. The California political machine didn't elect people to office, it appointed them, and she was one of the appointees. Long as she was willing to get on her knees, or on all fours, for low-down Willie Brown, then the men who ran California politics would do the rest. But now Kamala Harris finds herself out in the big, bad, real world. And whereas the black vote is inconsequential in California politics, nationally, it's another story. She could ignore the black vote in California and San Francisco, but it's political suicide to try that outside of California, especially in the South. But Kamala is helpless under these circumstances. She spent so long depending on her connections and her pals and patrons and sugar daddies to pull strings for her. Now she has to do the work for herself, and she can't. She doesn't know how to make the case for herself because she never had to before now. She doesn't know how to build a political base because she never had to do that either. She could break the law, lie through her teeth, and never had to pay a price for it because her political pals and the white media insulated her from all of what would ordinarily be the natural consequences of her misdeeds and crimes. Well, at least in California, they could. But now, they can't. Fall came and Kamala's campaign continued to sink. The quiet grumbling from inside her campaign had now become an open chorus of rebellion. Former white media allies were now forced to report on her floundering campaign. Her campaign was forced to announce that it was laying off staff and closing offices in order to save money. That tells people all they needed to know about her fundraising. They would be directing all of their funds and attention to the Iowa caucus. As I explained, she was still copying Obama's playbook without realizing it wouldn't work for her. Obama pulled off a surprise win in the Iowa caucuses, and that shocked everyone. And although he did not beat Hillary in New Hampshire, he did come in second, and that mattered because Democrats were desperately hoping for a viable alternative to Hillary in 2008, and Obama showed that he was viable. Black voters had had low confidence in Obama whether he could sway a critical mass of white voters to support him, but after his win in Iowa and high turnout in New Hampshire, those doubts were dispelled, and that helped him to turn the tide. So when he came to South Carolina, which was the first real primary where the Democratic base, the black vote, comes, comes into play, Obama carried South Carolina with 55% of the vote compared to Hillary Clinton's paltry 26%. 
As I have been telling you, her goal was to win, or at the very least, place very high in Iowa, and to try to stay in the race until the South Carolina primary, where she would pray that her boule connections, like her sorority pals, and the civil rights retreads, and the do-nothing black misleaders, would deceive enough elderly black voters to turn out for her. If she could just hang in the race until February, she could at least save face and bow out after a primary or two. Hang in there until February. That had been the goal. She wouldn't even make it that far. November 29th. Kamala's third quarter fundraising was lower than it had ever been. Donors were jumping ship, her poll numbers were at 3%, an all-time low, and then the New York Times published a story that was essentially the white media informing Harris that they were showing her the door. And it's not like Harris had a choice. The same way that certain interested white parties like Willie Brown could tell Villaraigosa to get out of the Senate race against Kamala is the same way that the white powers that be could tell Kamala to pack up tent and hit the road whether she wanted to or not. Kamala Harris is an invention of white supremacy, and the white media is white supremacy's mouthpiece. She doesn't exist without them, so when the white media tells her to hit the bricks, that's the end of it. The Times made a big deal out of publishing the resignation letter of Kamala Harris's former state operations director, Kelly Mellenbacher. In it, Mellenbacher gave the rundown about just how pitifully run the campaign was, and it was every bit as disorganized and chaotic as we thought. The staff was treated poorly, and while Harris has made a big deal out of marshalling all her resources in Iowa to make some sort of last stand there, the reality was that her campaign hadn't even bothered to formulate a plan for Iowa. And, in what I think was the most important part of the letter, Mellenbacher said that the Harris campaign had simply refused to confront their mistakes. To me, that is a veiled reference to Kamala Harris's refusal to own up to her own record. Her complete asinine refusal to admit to the 30 years of mistakes and crimes that she's committed against us was her undoing. Whenever she had a chance to tell the truth, instead she would double down on the lies, dodge the issue, try to talk around the elephant in the room, hope to distract onto something or someone else. It didn't fool anyone, and it did not pacify any of the critics. And her campaign, which took on the same duplicitous character of the woman who wasn't leading it, would go the way of Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris was going down, and she took the ship of fools who ran with her down with her. But then again, she's a lifelong race soldier for white supremacy. She didn't persecute black people by accident. She did it because she wanted to. Black people are not human beings to her. We are merely the dirty work that she has to do in order to keep getting caked off by her white supremacist paymasters. She is a bed-wenching mammy who does the job of sweeping black folks up so that she can deposit them into the large-scale containment of prison. That's what Kamala Harris sees her job as. She's got to sweep up after Massa. And black folks are the garbage that she sweeps up. At least that's what she thought. Mellenbacher was airing all of Kamala Harris's dirty laundry. This wasn't a resignation letter on Mellenbacher's part. She had already joined Michael Bloomberg's campaign, by the way. This was a calculated humiliation of Kamala Harris. This was meant to take the heart right out of her in her campaign, and it did. I've never seen the white media do this to a candidate before, not because they have any special contempt for Kamala, but rather because, as I've always told you, when white supremacy is done with one of its tools, it breaks that tool. This is the breaking of Kamala Harris, but the truth is it wasn't the white media who broke her. The black media did. The former slaves got together and in one voice said, We will not allow any of these stooges for white supremacy to speak for us. We are not immigrants, hence an immigrant cannot speak for us. We are not biracial, hence biracials cannot speak for us. We are a clear people with a clear identity, and we are going to stand up for that identity because that identity is worthy of being defended. She is the first political scalp. 
that the black media has claimed, but she won't be the last. Kamala Harris is not where this ends, not by a long shot, but she is the first, and that's important, because part of getting black folks on code is by enforcing the code, and the black media, you can call us code enforcement. I want the black family to be on code about this, because there will be those who will try to later on rehabilitate Kamala Harris's image, especially when she tries to run for re-election, because that's what we reduced her to. We have got to prove that when it comes to our interests, the descendants of American slaves, the foundational black Americans, we do not forget and we do not forgive. When it comes to our power, there are no second chances. Because the black agenda is the order of the day and it's going to be fiercely enforced. We did not ask any racist like Joe Biden or Tom Steyer or Kamala Harris what their idea of black empowerment or reparations was. We've told them what it is. There is nothing for them to do except to do it. But as far as they're concerned, well, you're going to have to break us if you're going to make us do what you want. Well, that's okay. The black media has a Ph.D. in breaking people. Don't believe it? Just ask the former presidential candidate Kamala Harris how things worked out. When she decided that she would run to the white media and run to the black bootlicks like the breakfast schlubs and run to the NAACP, man, she was running around like a chicken with her head cut off. Willie Brown was helpless before the black media. Joy Reid could do nothing. All the name calling and all of the distractions and obfuscations and political smoke screens and media diversions didn't work. It couldn't work. We were simply too big. And now that we squash Kamala Harris like a bug, we're looking around to deal with the rest of the political pests. But understand something, we're the ones in the driver's seat now. We have achieved this position by being uncompromising. And this is just the beginning. You haven't even seen us flex our muscles yet. This is just what we're doing with a couple of pennies in our pocket and a few people who are willing to get active. As we aggregate our power and aggregate our resources, you're going to be hearing some real screaming and yelling coming not just from the white media, but from their black bootlicks. All the people who have been getting caked off by white supremacy and depend on white supremacy for their daily bread, as we threaten their position, they will have no choice but to expose themselves. And as they do, they will set themselves up and will knock them down. The black media is on the march. And the road to black empowerment will be paved with the white supremacists and their black bootlicks who thought that they were going to stop this black agenda. Welcome to the new normal.